So, where shall we begin? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking into changes and omissions that the show Masters of the Air from Apple TV Plus and Steven Spielberg made compared to its source material and World War II history. Load up and keep your eyes open for spoilers. Good. This is how close I want you on my wing today. Just like we trained for. Yes, sir. Number 10. The Real Sandra Westgate we already know that the show does not shy away from blood, bullets, and heroism. Those of us who continued to fly mission after mission had to tiptoe around their ghosts. Some of the men were coming undone. But following in the footsteps of Band of Brothers and the Pacific, it also has moments of levity and even a bit of romance. While attending a conference for Allied Nations, the recently promoted Captain Crosby met subaltern A.M. Westgate, a junior female officer for the British forces with whom he starts a physical yet secretive, almost James Bond-like relationship. What is it? I have to leave. But now? Indeed. <sighs> Next time you're in London, ring me. We'll go dancing. Show creators confirmed that she is inspired by real-life soldier Landra Wingate, who is mentioned in Crosby's memoir. Her role in the war is as much a mystery in real life as it is in the show, with some going as far as to say she was actually Princess Elizabeth. You know, during these last few weeks, I have missed you terribly. And I just want to know where you've been. Do you want to know where I've been? Or do you want to know where I will be in 20 minutes? Number 9. Veteran Interviews and Accounts Fans of Band of Brothers all agree that the personal stories told by the actual members of Easy Company during the start and end of every episode gave the show an extra emotional push for audiences. I did things I didn't do them for medals, I didn't do them for accolades, I did them because that's what had to be done. The Pacific did away with them, and Masters follows its lead. And while some see this as a drawback, Masters of the Air author Donald Miller has stated that the reasoning for this is simple. It's a hell of an observation, Mission Major. Are they all like that? The people whose stories are being told were still alive during the production of Band of Brothers, but later shows did not have that luck, having to base their stories on memoirs first-hand accounts and interviews included in their source material. Most of us had never traveled far from home, let alone flown in an airplane. We came from every corner of the country with a common purpose, to bring the war to Hitler's doorstep. Number 8. The Swiss Camps Due to the nature of their war theaters, both Band of Brothers and Masters of the Air were able to take us on side stories with some of our protagonists and tackle other elements of the war without having them front and center. Brothers did this with the concentration camp arc in its ninth episode, Why We Fight. Will you ask him, uh, ask him what kind of camp this is? Um, what, uh, why are they here? Masters of the Air book author Donald Miller has stated that he would have liked the show to have mentioned the Swiss camps, a rarely talked about part of the war. Anyone see the other task forces? Radio negative. Voice negative. Dial negative. Negative, sir. Negative. Despite their neutrality, says Miller, many Swiss officials had ties to the Nazis and would often haul captured airmen to high mountain camps. However, with nine hours already in the production plan, creators were unable to include it. So if we can get out, we'll get out. And this you will be the one worth knowing. Number seven, the death of Babyface. Almost all bomber crew accounts include the infamous ball turret, a machine gun set up inside a crystal ball hanging from the bottom of the planes. It's generally thought of as the most dangerous position of the plane, with a very low probability of survival for the gunner. In an effort to highlight this risk, the creative team changed the details around the death of Sergeant William Hinton. I'm stuck! I can't get out of the turret! What do you mean you can't get out? The elevation clutch is jammed! It won't crank! In the show, Hinton is unable to be rescued from this ball turret and goes down with the damaged plane. In reality, while he was killed in action, he was already out of the turret but unable to bail out. Oh, and his nickname was not Babyface. We guess they just needed one more emotional hit point. I'm sorry, Babyface! No! Number 6. The Tuskegee Airmen 
The Tuskegee Airmen were a group of black airmen that flew and fought during World War II. The 99th Pursuit Squadron was part of that effort. They were known as the Tuskegee Airmen. Their inclusion in Masters of the Air came as a surprise for many, as they did fly a few missions with the 100th Bomb Group, but their stories are not intertwined. Gentlemen, welcome to paradise. Charles Sugata. The book does discuss racial tensions at the time. However, some critics have stated that their use in the show is almost superficial. They argue it could instead have led to a story of the airmen not going deep enough into their role and obstacles during the war, both on the home and fighting fronts. Why didn't you gripe about us bunking an eight? <sighs> well, let's just say I at least knew you weren't spies. <laughs> Ain't that a bitch. Number five, Stalag Luft Three. A big part of the second half of the series takes place in the POW camp Stalag Luft 3. At one point, our main protagonists end up here, and so begins an homage to the Great Escape, a moment that's referenced within the context of the show, with Buck and Bucky leading the men in planning an eventual escape. What are we waiting for? Huh? We all think something's gonna happen. Maybe we need to make it happen. Like those Brits did. Go and get executed. We have to be patient. In her review of the episodes, Air Force historian and POW expert and consultant to the show Marilyn Walton outlined some of the creative liberties taken in representing the camp. We gotta get the men in shape. It's not gonna look good to our German hosts now, is it? You gotta get these guys ready to fight. There's no telling what these crowds will do. These include the placement of the makeshift radio used by prisoners, the use of curtains instead of shutters, and even the signage outside the camp, with a sign reading Halt Kontrolle. Number four, the RAF raids. In a show already filled with World War II lore and stories, some contextual elements need to be left out to streamline the story. You know, I admire you Americans. You're up there in broad daylight seemingly oblivious to the downsides. I don't understand what you're saying, Captain. Masters of the Air makes it a point to show some of the animosity and back and forth between the British and American flying forces, including a fist fight with Austin Butler's Buck Clevin, discussing the morality or effectiveness of each of their approaches to bombing. I said it's a pity. You'd have more if you flew your missions at night. Why'd you have to go and say something like that? Or perhaps I was getting bored of all of the heavy petting going on at your end of the table. Now, while the 100th specialized in strategic daytime bombings on military and industrial targets, the RAF conducted, for the most part, nighttime bombings of populated areas, mainly in retaliation for the German Blitz campaign that almost decimated London, a point that is surprisingly missing from the show's motivations and overall story arc. The British, who have been at war with the Nazis for nearly four years, practiced nighttime area bombing. It was indiscriminate and deadly. Which was more effective depending on which uniform you wore. Number three, the Norden bomb site. While laying out the groundwork for the carnage to come, characters discuss the use and importance of the latest in military technology at the time, second only to the atom bomb, the Norden bomb site. There was only one reason the Americans could even attempt something as difficult and dangerous as precision bombing, the Norden bomb site. This equipment was so precise and important that crews were directed to discard it or destroy it if they should ever find themselves in a tough spot. Outside the atomic bomb, it was the most closely held secret of the war. Well, everything sounded well and good in the sales brochure, but the actual combat use of the site was fraught with problems related to cold temperatures, fog, and thanks to its incredible complexity and moving parts, a lot of human error, all of which were in ample supply up there at 30,000 feet, with the enemy engaging all around. At night, while the crews slept, the rest of the base worked tirelessly to get the flight plans, equipment, and planes ready. Number two, the fate of Lieutenant Curtis Biddick. During the Schweinfurt-Regensburg mission, the 100th suffered some of the heaviest losses of the war up to that point. If we succeed, we knock German production offline for months. There's no telling how many lives we could save. One of the toughest ones for the audience is that of Lieutenant Biddick, played by Gary Keoghan. In the show, after taking heavy fire, the crew of the bomber managed to bail out. However, Biddick remained on board to help his wounded co-pilot by landing the damaged aircraft and getting help. She's not gonna make it. 
Gotta get out. Island to crew, bail out, bail out. He fought the plane all the way down, crashing into a forest. In reality, crew reports from the time state that, quote, in holding the plane steady, he was caught by the fire in the cockpit and went down with the ship. It's a far more gruesome outcome than what was shown, but no less heroic. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. The 100th Bomb Group We have our heroes and our mission, but do we grasp the importance of the whole thing? Some say no. You working with these ruffians now? They're sure gonna give me a job. Let's come work with us. Gladly, sure. Couple of eager babies over here. Critics make a point that the show's sole focus on the almost nonsensical difficulty and meat grinder nature of the missions strays away from the actual context and reasoning behind the existence of the Bloody Hundredth. That's the mission, boys. Disrupt industrial transportation in the Ruhr Valley. Understood? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Doug Berkey, of Air and Space Forces Association's Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, maintains that the main reason for the raids was to avoid the attrition suffered during World War I, securing air dominance and dealing important and heavy blows to the German offensive. And while the early missions following this strategy seemed foolish and reckless, this early sacrifice by members of the group would pay dividends as the war moved along. What was your favorite moment from the show? How does it compare to its predecessors? Set your sights on the comments below and fire away. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.